Chapter 18 The next day, Dina was barely able to sit through her classes. All morning long, she kept hearing the masked man voice repeating his warning in her ear. Her shoulder was still sore from where he had grabbed her. Why didn't he kill us, she wondered. Why should he? She answered her own question. He'll be long gone on Saturday, and Chuck will be here to pay for his crime. Just before lunch, she went to her locker. Struggling to open it, she dropped her armload of books. When she leaned down to pick them up, her purse fell. Its contents poured out onto the floor. Need some help? asked a familiar voice. Dina stared up at Rob Morrell, who was smiling at her in a friendly way. She was too tired and flustered to do more than stammer thanks. But Rob didn't seem to mind. He bent down and helped her stow her gear away, then asked her to have a cook with him after school. Dina felt like bursting into tears. Thanks, Rob, but I have some things I have to do, she said. Rob looked disappointed, then shrugged. Well, maybe another time, he said, and he walked off down the hall. Dina watched him go, feeling terrible, but how could she tell him what she had to do? How could she tell him that she had to go visit her brother in jail? Her poor brother, who was going to stand trial for a murder he didn't commit. As she walked out of the building, Dina felt guilty. She should have gone to see Chuck long ago, but she just couldn't bring herself to do it. She didn't want to see him there in that awful jail. She didn't know what she'd say to him. But he had been asking about her. She really had no choice. She had to steal her nerves and face him. She had to tell him how the police wouldn't believe a word she said, and how miserably she had failed at being a detective. The heavy metal door shut behind her with a clang that made Dina jump. Her heart pounded furiously, and she followed the guard down a long, dark hall. The tile on the floor was discolored and scarred from the thousands of feet that had walked this same hall on the way to being locked up. The hall passed through two more metal doors, then opened into a large, nearly empty, fluorescent-lit room. Please sit here, said the guard. They'll bring your brother out in a minute. She gave Dina a big, friendly smile. Dina just stared at her. How could anyone be cheerful in a place like this? The guard left Dina alone in the room. It was narrow and windowless, divided down the center with a long formica-covered counter. From the counter to the ceiling, wire screening extended to keep the visitors and the prisoners from touching each other. At the farthest end of the room, a young woman sat hunched over the counter, sobbing into a handkerchief. Dina couldn't see whom she was talking with, but could hear the low, monotonous drone of a man's voice from the other side of the screen. Her knees quaking, Dina took a seat on a beat-up wooden chair on the visitor's side of the counter. She'd never been in such a dismal place, and wasn't sure she wanted to be there now. What would Chuck be like, she wondered. Would he look different? Would he act different? Tougher, maybe? She felt so nervous she wished she could just run away. After endless minutes, an armed guard led Chuck into the other section of the room, on the other side of the screen. He was wearing a light blue cotton shirt and dungarees, and Dina thought he looked pale and thin. He didn't see her at first, but when he did, he burst away from the guard and came running toward her. Dina! She stood up to greet him. Stop right there, the guard screamed. You know the rules! Chuck immediately stopped a few inches from the screen and slumped into the folding chair provided for prisoners. No more fast moves, you hear, the guard warned, crossing his arms over his chest and staring at them both. Chuck, hi, Dina said uncomfortably. She forced herself to look into his eyes. They were red-rimmed and watery. You've got to get me out of here, he said in a loud whisper. Huh? She wasn't sure she'd heard him correctly. I can't take it, Dina. I really can't. I'm going out of my mind. He closed his eyes and pressed his forehead against the screen. Back up, the guard called, uncrossing his arms and taking a step toward Chuck. Sorry, Chuck called back to him loudly, and he sat up straight. Next warning, and you go back in your cell, the guard said. It's terrible in here, Chuck said, keeping his voice low. It's just a hundred humiliations a day. Most of the men in here are criminals, real criminals, robbers and drug dealers. And there's one guy who brags about how he killed a whole family of campers in a state park. Dina stared at him, trying to keep the tears out of her eyes. That's so awful, she managed to say. I've got to get out. I've got to. I can't believe this is happening to me. It just isn't fair. Dad says the lawyer will get you out soon. He just has to get the charge changed to manslaughter, Dina said, but it sounded pretty lame even to her. It won't be soon enough, Chuck cried. I've got to get out now. Jade and I are trying to help, Dina told him. For the first time, Chuck's face brightened. How is Jade? She's worried about you. That makes two of us, he said glumly. Jade and I have found out some things, Dina whispered. Two more minutes, the guard interrupted, looking at the large round clock on the far wall. Dina quickly told Chuck about Farberson, about the plane reservations, and about their trip to Miss Morrison's house. Whoa, Chuck said. You two really took a chance. I can't believe you did that for me. 
Well, you're my brother, said Dina. Besides, Jade and I are involved, too. Yeah, but you're not behind bars, he said, turning bitter again. Man, if only I were out of here. I'd go right to Fear Street, right to Farberson's house, and I'd search the place till I found the evidence I need to prove that he's guilty. Okay, Dina said. What? What do you mean, okay? He looked confused. Jade and I will go to his house. No, wait. I didn't mean for you to do it. I said I would do it if I were out. Well, we're out and you're not, so we'll... No way, Chuck screamed. No way. It's too dangerous. The man is a killer. No way. I won't let you go there. He jumped to his feet and pressed his hands against the screen. Hey, the guard yelled. We're going and you can't stop us, Dina declared. We only have till tomorrow night to prove he's guilty. No way. I won't let you do it, Chuck screamed. No. I warned you, the guard said, moving quickly. He grabbed Chuck with both hands and pulled him away from the screen. Let me go, Chuck snapped angrily at the guard and struggled out of his grasp. I don't want you to go to Fear Street, he shouted to Dina. The guard grabbed him from behind and started to put a chokehold on him. Do I have to get rough, kid? Get off me, Chuck raged. Dina couldn't bear it any longer. She stood up and turned away. The other guard appeared suddenly and led her out of the room. As the door closed, she could still hear Chuck scuffling with the other guard. Dina! Dina, did you hear me? He was screaming after her. Chapter 19 By the time she got home from the jail, Dina felt awful. Her head ached and she felt sick to her stomach. Maybe I'm getting the flu, she thought. Maybe I'll just go to bed and hide under the covers and all this will go away. But she knew it wouldn't. The only way to make it go away was to go to Fear Street and prove that Farberson was the murderer. At dinner, she didn't feel like eating, and as usual, her mother noticed. What's the matter, honey? She said. Don't you feel well? I'm all right, said Dina. To prove it, she took a big bite of mashed potatoes. Usually they were her favorite, but that night they tasted like sawdust. I know what it is, said her mother. You're worried about Chuck, aren't you? Dina nodded. She didn't trust herself to say anything more. We're all worried, Dina, said her father. But remember that Chuck brought a lot of this on himself. If you kids hadn't made those full phone calls. He didn't murder anyone, Dina shouted, surprising herself with her outburst. He's not a criminal, but the police have locked him up like one, and now you're saying he deserves it. Now, just a minute, young lady, said her father. I did not say any such thing. I only meant... Dina didn't wait for him to finish. She pushed herself away from the table, ran upstairs to her room, and threw herself on the bed, sobbing. A few moments later, her mother tapped on the door. May I come in? she asked. Help yourself, Dina mumbled. Her mother sat on the edge of the bed and began to rub her back. You mustn't be angry with your father, she said. Don't you know how hard this is on him? After all, Chuck is his only son. I'm sorry, Mom. I just don't want to talk about it. I'm tired, and I just want to be left alone. Her mother patted her and stood up with a worried look. All right, honey, she said. If you want to talk later, I'll be downstairs. After a while, Dina stopped crying and splashed water on her face. Then she sat down and tried to work on her trig homework, but she couldn't concentrate. It was no use. No matter what she tried to think about, her thoughts kept coming back to one thing. She had to go to Fear Street. The phone rang and she jumped, her heart suddenly beating fast. What if it was him? But it was Jade. How was Chuck? She asked right away. Angry and bitter, said Dina. But who can blame him? He said to tell you hi. How did he look? Like a prisoner, said Dina irritably. What do you expect? You don't need to bite my head off, said Jade. Sorry, said Dina. I guess this is all getting to me. Me too, said Jade. What are we going to do next? I guess we're going to have to pay a return visit to Fear Street, Dina said. Jay didn't say a word in reply. Dina was so tired she managed to sleep well that night, and she woke up feeling refreshed and energetic until she remembered what day it was and what she and Jade were going to do that night. Maybe it wouldn't be so bad, she told herself. For one thing, Farberson would probably be working. They'd have all the time they needed to find something linking him to the murder. At lunch, Jade was actually cheery. Ready for another adventure? she asked, setting down her tray. It was hard to think of it as an adventure. But Jade's good mood relaxed Dina, and she felt even more cheerful when Rob Morrell waved at her across the cafeteria, then gave her a wink. By the end of the day, she felt nervous but confident. The only thing bothering her, in fact, was that it was beginning to cloud up outside. But what was a little rain? By the time Dina got home from school, it was pouring. The house was as dark as night. Dina's mother worked late on Fridays, and her father wasn't home yet. Dina put down her books and was heating up some soup in the kitchen when the phone rang. Hello, Dina? It was her father. Hi, Daddy, she said, trying to sound cheerful. Some weather, eh? He said. Listen, we've had some trouble down here at the phone company. Lightning stuck a transformer, and the phones are all out on the south side of town. 
Everyone's staying late till we get it all straightened out. Tell your mother not to wait up for me. Okay, Daddy, she said. Try to stay dry. She quickly ate a bowl of soup, then changed into sweatpants, a warm jacket, and her rain poncho. Just before leaving, she wrote her mother a note saying that she had gone over to Jade's house to study. Then she walked down to the Division Street Mall, where she and Jade had arranged to meet. What a night to be without wheels, she thought. By the time she got there, she was drenched. Jade was waiting in front of the pizza restaurant, wearing a bright yellow raincoat, and somehow managing to look fashionable and dry at the same time. I feel like I'm a drowned duck, Dina complained. You look like one too, Jade agreed. Ready? I guess so, said Dina. But let's call first to make sure Farberson's not home. Jade dropped a coin into a payphone, then hung up, a frown on her face. That's funny, she said. I didn't get anything. Not a ring, not a busy signal, just dead air. I forgot, Dina told her. My dad called. The phones are out on the south side of town. Oh no, said Jade. What do we do? We'll just have to go on over there, said Dina. What choice do we have? If we see a light on, we'll think of another plan. Jade nodded. I'm sure he'll be at the restaurant, she said. He wouldn't want to do anything unusual. Not the night before he's leaving, right? Right, said Dina, hoping it was true. The two girls left the mall, then caught the Waynesbridge bus, which crossed Division Street, then went south on the Mill Road. The bus was warm and comfortable, and Dina tried not to think about where it was taking them. Too soon, Jade nudged her. It's the next stop, she said. Reluctantly, Dina pulled the stop signal, and the bus pulled onto a small roadside clearing. It looked deserted there, with thickly overgrown bushes and trees growing right up to the edge of the road. Water dripped everywhere, and though it was still early, the storm clouds were so thick it was as dark as midnight. Overhead, the sky flashed with lightning, and the booming sound of thunder shook the ground. A stream splashed angrily along a ditch beside the mill road. Nice neighborhood, Jade cracked. Very funny, said Dina. She squinted through the gloom, then saw a street sign a few feet down the road. This way, Dina said, and the girls slogged along the muddy shoulder to the crossroad. One arm of the sign read, in rustic letters, the mill road, at an angle, the other arm read, Fear Street. The girls exchanged looks. Dina hoped she didn't look as scared as Jade did. Hey, it's just a street, right? said Jade, trying to smile. Right, said Dina. Chapter 20 Feeling wet and miserable, the girls began to trudge east on Fear Street toward the Farberson house. As she walked, Dina tried to pretend she was on any other street in town. In all the rain, however, she had to admit Fear Street didn't look gloomier than any other street. After they'd walked a little more than a block, the rain intensified, and with it the howling wind. Overhead, lightning continued to flash. What was that? Jade suddenly shrieked, grabbing Dina's arm. Dina turned and saw something, something dark and sleek, disappear into a yard across the street. Probably just a dog, she said. In any way, it's gone. They continued walking, their feet squishing on the mud and water that cascaded along the broken pavement. Shouldn't we be there by now? Jade asked. There's the house, Dina said, pointing. The Farberson house was completely dark. The two girls made their way up to the porch and looked into the living room window. Too dark to see anything. He must be at the restaurant, Jade said. Thank goodness. Dina went to the front door. There was a bright yellow tape across the door that said, Crime scene. She tried the handle, but the door was locked. We'll have to break the window and go in, Jade said. No, not in front. Someone might see us. Come on, let's go around the back. They hurried around to the back, slipping on the wet mud at the side of the house. The rain had slowed a little, but lightning continued to flare as they stepped up to the back door. The glass in the kitchen door had not been replaced. The empty paint had been covered with a piece of cardboard, so soggy it nearly disintegrated when Dina pulled it off. She put her ear to the empty pane. There was no sound inside. Hello, she called, ready to run if there was an answer. The only reply was a whistling wind and a tapping of dripping water. Carefully, she reached her arm through the space and found the doorknob, then flipped off the lock. Okay, she said, slowly pushing the door in. Let's go. The girls exchanged frightened looks, then stepped into the dark and empty house. The first thing Dina noticed was that Mr. Farberson hadn't bothered to clean up since the last Saturday night. The kitchen table was standing right side up, but the counter and floor were still covered with spilled spices and flour. Her flashlight beam showed mouse tracks in the powdery debris. Yuck, she said, this is disgusting. If you think the kitchen's disgusting, you ought to see the living room, called Jade. Dina followed her friend's voice to the scene of the Saturday night horrors. Dark stains still showed on the carpet and a bright yellow chalk line left by the police showed where Mrs. Farberson's body had lain. The floor was still littered with broken lamps and ashtrays. Mr. Farberson hadn't even bothered to pick up the cushions scattered around the room. What a mess, said Dina. I don't even know where to start. Do you see anything that looks like a desk? Jade asked. Maybe we'll find some papers, insurance, a diary, something. 
The girl swung her flashlights across the room, but there was no sign of a desk or even a writing table. Look at this, said Jade, pointing with the beam of her flashlight. To one side of the couch lay a basket full of old magazines. Hold the flashlight while I look through these, she said. Jade knelt and rapidly flipped through a half dozen periodicals. There were several issues of weight loss magazines and something called Your Modern Home, with mailing labels addressed to Mrs. Edna Farberson. Well, that was helpful, Jade said, brushing dust off her hands. Dina went to the telephone stand, which contained only the phone and a phone book. She pulled on the drawer, but it was stuck. In frustration, she pounded on it and pulled again with all her strength. The drawer suddenly came loose, sending the telephone clattering to the floor. Jade let out a little shriek. Will you be careful? she said. I think I found something, said Dina, suddenly excited as a small white notepad fell out of the drawer. She picked it up and examined it under the flashlight. False alarm, she said. It's completely blank. Wonderful, said Jade. Come on, let's try upstairs. As they began to walk up the old creaking stairs, Dina heard a noise that caused a chill to return to her spine. Do you hear that? she whispered. Now Jade, too, stopped. That creaking sound? It sounds like someone in a rocking chair, Dina said. Do you suppose? But who could it be, said Jade. Mr. Farberson's at work and Mrs. Farberson's dead. What am I doing here, Dina thought. It's probably nothing, she said, trying to convince herself. By now, they had reached the top of the stairs. It's coming from behind that door, she said. Holding her breath, Dina forced herself to tiptoe toward the room. She reached out and pushed the door open. It was a bedroom with a big four-poster bed and two large bureaus. Against the far wall, a casement window hung open. With every gust of wind, it swung back and forth, making the weird creaking noise. This house is too spooky, Jade observed from the doorway. This is one spook I'm going to put an end to, said Dina. She crossed to the window, nearly slipping in a puddle of rainwater that had blown into the room. The good news is that it stopped raining, she told Jade. What's the bad news, said Jade. I can't get the window shut, said Dina. It's stuck against a branch. There's a huge tree right outside. Let me help, said Jade. She came over and pushed against the overgrown branch of a big maple tree while Dina pulled the window shut. Good work, said Dina. That sound was making me crazy. She swung the flashlight around the room. Think we'll find anything in here, she said. There's nothing in the closet, Jade's muffled voice reported. Just a bunch of women's clothes. It all smells like mothballs. The next room was smaller than the first, and as soon as they opened the door, Dina knew they hit the jackpot. This has to be the study, she said with growing excitement. Great, Jade said, her voice beginning to show some of her old excitement. In front of the window stood an old metal desk, its top covered with papers. A two-drawer file cabinet was set in a corner, its drawers standing open and empty, while across from the desk was a day bed, also heaped high with papers. Several boxes and green plastic trash bags sat in disarray, stuffed with papers and files. Looks as if Mr. Farberson's clearing out his files, said Jade, sounding satisfied. But it could take weeks to go through this stuff, said Dina, and we don't even know what we're looking for. We probably don't have to go through it all, said Jade. Just skim through the things on top. That's probably the stuff that he's been looking at most recently. You take the couch and I'll look at the things on the desk. Dina sat on the couch and began to look through the stacks of files piled there. She flipped through several file folders, mostly containing receipts for household bills, old income tax forms, and check stubs. She was about to move on when her eye fell on a piece of paper folded and unfolded so many times. It was fragile enough to fall apart at a touch. I think I found something, she told Jade. That makes one of us, said Jade. What is it? A letter, said Dina, from Mrs. Farberson to Mr. Farberson. Listen to this. Dear Stan, Dina read, there's no use arguing anymore. I have made up my mind to leave you, and nothing will change that. I know you can't make a go of the restaurant. Once I gave you the money to buy it, I believe that finally you will be successful at something, but once again you are failing. I refuse to give you any more money. In the last five years you have gone through almost all of my inheritance. I have to save something for myself. I'll be by Saturday night to pick up my things. Goodbye, Edna. That's it, said Jade. That's why he killed her. She had money and she was leaving him. It's sort of sad though, said Dina. It sounds as if she once really cared for him. Which was obviously a big mistake, said Jade. Anyway, we've got what we came for. Let's get out of here. Okay, said Dina. Just give me a minute. I want to check the closet. What for? We have enough evidence to go to the police? I want to try to find the mask, Dina said. Okay, said Jade, but hurry. Dina opened the closet and turned the flashlight in. There's a suitcase in here, she said. Forget it, said Jade urgently. I hear a car coming. Probably just someone driving by, said Dina. She opened a suitcase to find piles of shirts, socks, and trousers. Slipping her hand down by the clothes, she felt around, but there was nothing else. 
Disappointed, she snaps the suitcase shut and begins to inspect the contents of the shells. The car sounds closed, said Jade, sounding nervous. Come on, forget the mask. All right, said Dina. She backed out of the closet and slipped the letter from Mrs. Farberson into the waistband of her sweats. And froze. Now she could hear the car, too. Hear it slow down, then turn into the Farberson's driveway. It can't be him, Dina whispered. It's too early. The car door opened and slammed shut. Heavy footsteps began to walk toward the house. There was the sound of a key turning in the lock, and the front door began to creak open. Chapter 21 Both girls stood very still, scarcely breathing. They could hear someone walking around, and then saw a sudden glow from a light that had been switched on downstairs. We've got to do something, Jade whispered at last. Like what? said Dina. All we can do is wait. Maybe he just came in to pick something up. She nervously fingered a letter in her waistband. It was the proof they needed, the proof that would save Chuck. Somehow they had to get it to the police. But would they be able to leave? From downstairs, they could hear Mr. Farberson walking toward the kitchen. What if he's home for good, said Jade, echoing Dina's own fears. Maybe the restaurant closed early, or maybe he got sick. Then we'll just have to wait till he's asleep, said Dina. There's no reason for him to know we're here. Let's just put our rain gear back on in case we have to hide. As quietly as possible, Jade tiptoed to the desk and took her raincoat and Dina's poncho from the back of the desk chair where they left them. On the way back, her foot creaked in a loose board, and both girls held their breath for a moment, but there was no response from downstairs. My mom's going to kill me, whispered Jade, struggling into her yellow slicker. I told her I'd be home by ten. Jade, your mom isn't our major problem right now, Dina whispered. The girls carefully sat down on the edge of the daybed and waited, and waited. Each minute seemed to take an hour. The poncho was hot, and even though the room was chilly, Dina felt a drop of perspiration roll down her back. If only there was some other way out of the house. What was Mr. Farberson doing now, she wondered. There hadn't been a sound from him in a long time. I can't stand it, whispered Jade suddenly. I'm going to see if I can get a peek. Maybe it isn't even Mr. Farberson down there. Before Dina could protest, Jade slipped out into the hall. A few moments later, she came back, her face looking very worried in a dim light. He's on the couch with his head back, she reported. He's snoring. Dina took a deep breath. Maybe we ought to try to sneak past him, she said. What do you think? Jade nodded. Both girls took big gulps of air, then began to tiptoe down the hall toward the stairway. The wooden floor was very old, and each step caused a creaking that sounded as loud as an ambulance siren to Dina. They reached the head of the stairs. From down below, Dina could hear the muted sounds of Mr. Farberson's snores. She started down the stairs, Jade right behind her, now she could see the top of Mr. Farberson's head propped against the back of the sofa. She took another step, and the snoring stopped. Mr. Farberson grunted, then sat up and stretched. He yawned loudly, and then leaned back again. Dina and Jade froze. Then, still as quietly as possible, they turned around and went back up the stairs and down the hall. By the time they got to Mr. Farberson's office, Dina's hands were shaking. She backed into the office, followed by Jade, and collided with a metal wastebasket. The wastebasket fell with a clatter. Almost immediately, Mr. Farberson growled from downstairs. What the devil, he said. Dina and Jade studied each other with wide, frightened eyes. Quickly, Jade turned the wastebasket right side up. In the closet, she whispered to Dina. Now Dina could hear Mr. Farberson's footsteps climbing the stairs. He didn't seem to be in any hurry, but his steps sounded heavy, and she remembered how big he was. She slipped into the closet, Jade right behind her. They got as far back in as they could, behind some coats and shirts. The footsteps came closer. Then there was a click, and a sliver of light appeared under the closet door. Hello, mumbled Mr. Farberson. Is someone here? They heard him walk around the office, muttering to himself. Then his footsteps retreated, and they could hear him walking down the hall to check the other room. He moved around a bit more, and the girls heard a heavy creaking as he settled himself at his desk. For a moment, there was no sound. Then a bellow broke the silence. Hey, Mr. Farberson said out loud. How these drops of water get all over everything. Then suddenly, a chair scraped back, and heavy footsteps crossed the room. The closet door swung open. Dina blinked against the light, unable to see anything. But then she saw Mr. Farberson, his angry face staring directly at her. His expression changed slowly. The anger faded and was replaced by a cruel, mocking smile. Well, well, girls, he said. Just can't stay away, can you?